Se que de lo bajo, se que de lo bajo, olu a mi o ti de o yo se que de lo bajo. The Ashen Forge. Hello and welcome to the Ashen Forge. I am Phantom X joined as always by Diggs and the legendary Neurotoxid. How are you two doing? Doing all right. Back for another wonderful Sunday discussion on the ashes of creation and still a ton to discuss. Um, got a node stream. We had the uh, interview today, uh, which was about an hour long uh, with Stephen uh, at the Okai Theater. A um, couple of people that are in Discord all the time, actually. Um, so uh, celebrating their six years, but just a, a ton of stuff to talk about. Um, in general. In general. But before jumping in, anything anything y'all want to talk about? Anything updates, new stuff? Diggs is jumping back into No Man's Sky. Uh, mm -hmm. See how that goes. I've been uh, playing Paleo a bit the past few days. Uh, it's starting to pick up, but then I'm already also starting to kind of see the end in sight because I've played it a couple times before. And it's it's one of those things. Once I get nine of a certain thing going and five of another thing, four of another thing, and then my money woes are no issue. And then it's just how much do I want to run around? Chopping down trees and bonking rocks and catching fish and bugs and all that stuff to meet and greet and make better friends with all the characters you can talk to every day to raise your rep with them. And apparently there's a more um, well-defined romance meter for the romanceable NPCs. But the uh, shrewd Mel Brooks, Mel Brooks style businessman character, he is not on the list of romanceable NPCs. I'm very disappointed in that. Oh, well, uh, I am enjoying it. Uh, they've got a little uh, event going. It's cute. It's very, you know, cozy and collaborative. If you participate in the uh, little event that goes on where you got to grab the little beaver squirrel things with the hats on and throw them back in the bin. Everybody who participates, you get some uh, some of the reward tickets to redeem prizes from the event that are only available while the event's going. So. You know, that's cute. It it gives a bit of a sense of what they may be trying to do to keep players engaged if they've got enough events going in all the different regions that there's always some special thing to do. Then, you know, that's a good way to, um, you know, keep keep things live and fresh instead of just being kind of a static world and all the things you can do in it essentially until you're done with them. Yeah, yeah that's good to hear. I haven't had time to play much of anything, and Paleo is one of the things that I do want to play, but I haven't had a chance to really do much since the uh, beta started. Um, but I, and I'm, I, there's more stuff that I would like to do in there that I think is not available yet, like some other regions I'd like to explore, and I'd like to have some roles, like I would love to be a scholar or something like that in that game um even though it's not really a role-playing game but um there's well, you can catch bugs and make mayonnaise like for that one lady yep yep <laughs> and um you don't actually make mayonnaise for her she i'm sure she'd want you to make something far more eccentric the personalities of the characters like the writing of them is pretty good they don't yep. they aren't fully voiced but you get enough of their you know actions and personality and demeanor to get what sort of like hate to say it but what sort of tropes they basically fill yeah yeah there's there's just i don't think anything for me long term and and palia that i mean it's for what it is it's a good game uh so so oh, what, yeah. are, what are you what are you cute. getting Those from you. this uh this event uh, is it just like um items uh, skins is it 
furniture yeah there's um consumables limited time event consumables you can purchase there's uh, a little bit of questing back and forth talking to npcs getting into some mischief um that results in a couple thousand gold worth of uh uh just straight cash plus a bunch of extra resources so you get a little bit of this and that you get a little extra exposure into the personalities of the characters and and that sort of stuff that you wouldn't normally be able to see during normal gameplay so both from like the narrative rp learning the character side of things as well as consumables you can get and um yeah decorations and furniture and things you can get there's a wallpaper i got that i'm pretty happy with I feel like in, in the uh, alpha testing component, kind of learned how to min-max the farming, placement of crops, jellies, jams, uh, whatever it is you sell. They, they nerfed some of the values of some of the, the ultra earning things. But yeah, uh, a lot of that's kind of similar. Um, so I don't know. I feel like I explored what it had to offer me. <laughs> And that there's not been a lot more added to it to offer me. So, um, I don't know. I mean, it's sure hopefully will grow well over time. But Yeah, and kind of like No Man's Sky in some ways. It might take a couple of years, last a few years, and maybe they'll add enough stuff that, um, you know, it'll... Yeah. Um, Blossom. No Man's Sky, for, for what it is, has grown into an absolutely amazing game. I wish they added more than four-person multiplayer. Like, if you could add 10, 12 people, I think that would be pretty fun. But um, for what it is, and the expeditions, and all these different ways to play it, has just turned into a really, really pretty fun um, fun game. That um, I was watching a video. I downloaded it. I'm, you got me interested. <laughs> Oh, there's just there's tons. I mean, it's it's and I've been um, I played Starfield for a while, completely kind of lost interest in that just because uh, it's just basically a space RPG. It wasn't really exploration based. Um, story is fun, but that's the other thing I think NMS kind of lacks a little bit is some of the story elements, obviously, when you compare it to a Bethesda or something like that. Um, Not an RPG. Yeah, but um, it's it's got enough to keep you interested for quite a long time. I mean, part of it's like the maybe not story, but the, you know, discovery and exploration of who's been there and what. And, yeah, you might find some stuff that it's pretty cool. And the people did a good time, good, good job curating like the names of the plants and animals. And so it's like a really neat, intriguing place. And then you might end up on like Ball's World and everything is named Dick Monster. It's like. Great. You know, well, this <laughs> you can rename things. You can rename things if you want to. Oh, you can't rename things. At least when I was playing, this was back in the original run. When you came to something that somebody else already discovered and named the things, that was it. It was it was locked in. So, you know, you're not you're not going to come to a pre-generated Balls World with Dick Monsters. That's somebody who's come through and forever um, uh, uh, polluted that particular planet with their their filth. <laughs> but yeah if you enjoy it uh, i'll play with anybody that's interested in playing so cool. but ashes of creation so i kind of want to start with and i don't think you got to watch it digs this this interview conversation today um i feel for the people that did it because afterwards it was a lot of oh that was terrible and they didn't ask this question and they didn't ask that question like been there yeah <laughs> yeah back. and that's it you can't you can't satisfy everyone you can't ask every question they literally don't give you the time that's not the point the point as i said before is you give open-ended things and let um steven get more and more excited till he like you know really puts his foot in his mouth and accidentally says something he's not supposed to and that's like back off or like you know doesn't even realize that he spilled some detail that isn't actually common to us yet um so like that's that's the point of it don't come in there with like this bullet point list thinking oh we're gonna answer this 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 that's literally something that as we say in the industry this meeting could have been an email 
if if that's all it's going to be, he can do Q and A's by by text, but that's not fun. You know, you get him in there, you interact. It's fun. He likes to do it too. Hey, guess what? Uh, uh, Stephen Sharif is a person who likes like getting on and talking with people who are excited in the project that he's making and enjoy talking about MMOs in general. So it's something for him too that he he gets to enjoy. So if everything doesn't get answered, whatever, you know, there's time. He even backed off from something saying, you know, just wait a second. We'll have the fighter preview coming soon. So, uh, you know, I'm excited for that. He he said it in such a way that it sounds imminent. And that's what I'm thinking is like, maybe that's going to be next month even or the month after. But sounds like that one's probably going to be coming along here, you know, sooner than later for the end of the year. Well, so the next stream was announced this uh, in Discord, I think, this morning, which is World Events, which we can talk about, too. But um, nice. Yeah, I, mean, I missed was, that announcement, but that's exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, I, we've been there. I know what it is. I've, I've and I even try to explain that in Discord. It's like, well, you have to understand, like, it's stressful. It's there's anxiety. You're trying to not disappoint a very large community. Uh, you're still also trying to answer your own questions. Um but one thing I found There's tech stuff that you have to be concerned about too. And yeah, it's just not easy. In chat. Yeah. There's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Just, just not an easy process. And we've done it three times now and it just gets more anxiety provoking every time. <laughs> um, but I, I, I was watching NARC afterwards. Actually, he did a stream during it as well, which is sometimes funny to listen to him chat, but um Apparently, they were on his stream afterwards, and I don't know if one or more of them are in PI, uh, the Phoenix Initiative. So they're actually under an NDA, which meant they couldn't ask like a bulk of the questions that we that the community submitted because they were under an NDA and already know some of the answers, apparently, or some of the ideas. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of mm -hmm. weird, kind of weird to, to announce a, an interview kind of knowing that you can't really say much, but um, it was good. I, there were some there were some points that came out of it. Started with the very first question <laughs> was this too much healing in the game, which I thought was weird. Um, it's is right. there too much healing? I don't know. Is there not enough damage? Like, is there I don't think the game's got a like. And then there was the other question about anti healing. I I appreciate the question. I know where they're going with that sort of thing, but like uh, the first thing that popped in my head, it would have been a very snarky and not Steven like answer would have been, well, yeah, damage is anti-healing. But no, I, I see what they mean about ways to mitigate somebody's ability to get restoration in the heat of combat so you can actually chip them down and take them out. So, you know, but his answer was great. Like, you know, too much healing. We haven't even played it yet. Like. Yeah, you're you're you're, talk, you're talking about too much healing. We haven't even gotten into preseason. Like I want more. Like I want to see more classes with healing. Uh, you know, and I, I think when you put in perspective that that what we did see with the cleric was Stephen one with no cooldowns and two with access to every skill. It probably would look like you have a lot of healing, but that's not how it will actually play. So it's. It, it, I think there's another thing. It's not healing is that everyone's going to have forms of mitigation which might have some self heals it might have other sorts of things that are you know a summoner for example what's their mitigation oh i'm going to put my summon creature between me and the thing that wants to hurt me great you know that's a great source of armor hmm. it isn't yeah. even hitting me or i would imagine there's also a uh, lifelink sorts of things where you'd both be banging on the thing and trying to use your Drain lives and the um, uh, uh, share healing or whatever. So you're basically talking each other off and, you know, the, doing the take damage, get more uh, beefy sort of thing going on. I'm sure there will be synergies like that. There was a question about DPS meters. Wait, um, one of the things that I liked most about that answer to the healing question, one of the things that I found interesting was that he said, he likes high difficulty, um, which to me means it's, again, designed to be a little bit more niche than I was originally expecting because... Did he say high difficulty doing, or high challenge? He said high difficulty. 
And the first part of his answer to that is he likes high difficulty. Um, and I'm just saying, you know, and, and he did say that, you know, I don't know anybody who likes easy games, but I personally like, um, and he was like, well, maybe there are some people who like easy, easy games, but I really enjoy high difficulty. Um, and Ashes aims to be a more difficult leveling experience than we have seen in the past MMOs for the past 10 years, I think he said. Um, so. Well, we need to go back it's, farther it's than 10 years. It's well, right. And so when you think about um, uh, who the target audience is, as we've been spending six years trying to figure out who that is, um, it seems to be getting narrowed fairly. Uh, um, well, it's becoming more narrowed, I think, uh, in the past year or two. Of course, again, we have Bill Trost on, so we'll have to see how um, if that changes anything. But, Funny enough, there was but, a... Sorry, I'll be real quick. Funny enough, there was a uh, question that did get the answer of, well, maybe this game just isn't for you, kind of. Um, and it was a question about PVE, hardcore PVE players and will they have encounters or how were they, what would their role be in, in the raiding scene um, when they don't want PvP? So anyways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was uh, one thing that I thought was a little funny when they were talking about um, DPS meters and that sort of thing. Uh, I do like Steven's answer very much about um, not um, not liking best in slot and um, uh, build of the month sort of things that, yes, they're effective. Yes, they're well constructed, but everything just becomes boring when it's just this leveling match of like five or six different builds every specific class is going to use or not even class every specific role is going to use and depending on you know what class is going to do it maybe you spec it a bit different whatever now that um uh the that sort of stuff the uh the dps meter being like um you know, the metric that that forces people to go a certain direction that you have to do it this way or do it that way. And I think of, well, what what's a game that did it in such a way that that was almost impossible? Like, yeah, you could get things that filled each of the higher quality slots in a certain way, but it, you could have things made that same part made by different vendors and then being dynamically different in quality and function. And of course, uh, for those who remember shows that I've done in the past, you might take a drink when I say Star Wars Galaxies. I don't actually know that there were like unique orange quality best in slot items that people were grinding bosses a thousand times for a thousand hours to try to get. I don't think it worked like that. If I remember correctly, some of the higher quality uh, rare items and things along those lines were the armor pieces that you or the little mods and stuff that you would put on. So that way you could craft higher quality gear that it wasn't a best in slot because you couldn't have a best in slot. Everything came from uh, a somewhat common pool of patterns and prototypes uh, that everybody's able to craft. And what you're putting into it is the highest quality materials that you have on hand to fulfill each role. There might be a metal that needs uh, to be very malleable and uh, conductive. So you've got like gold or something like a real high quality gold that you put in for that component it makes the item a lot higher quality. And so I think about that with kind of the crafting system as well as the augment system that between what's actually available based on what the crafters have, what the crafters can make um, and, and what's available on the item side of things that there won't necessarily be a best in slot as well. I don't think there's going to be best in slot for like skills and build because everybody is almost guaranteed going to have a completely different set of augments available from where they reside their, um, you know, the, the, the type of node, uh, influences and stuff for their guild or even if they're solo and they have a different set of things that comes from that you know all these other influences and factors and things things they've done that give them different augments so it's really hard to say oh 
just get a this and a this and a this and then use this skill, this skill, this skill. You might be giving somebody like the prototype for a build and a way to play and a way to min max to an extent. But that's not going to be a total like you put all these things on, you do it in this way. And, you know, anything less than that is, you know, non viable DPS. Uh, that's not going to be the case. And so I like that there's going to be so much experimentation going on, that there is an emphasis on don't worry about trying to min max and look at a DPS meter. You've got to, you know, play around with your strengths, what's available, uh, you know, learn from other players a bit, try some things on your own. And that's where we're going to be seeing the um, the top level skill and the top level gameplay. Um, it, it, just to kind of round this out real quick before I pass it back to you guys, the idea of there not being uh, a DPS meter, uh, the example that I thought of, and he almost immediately said it at the same time in um, uh, in the show, as I was saying it in chat, you know, in tabletop role playing games. I'm a player. I roll my dice. I know what those die values are. But behind the DM screen, I don't know what the DM's rolling. And I also don't know the attributes of the things that that are changing. So while I might think that I've been doing eights and tens and twelves of damage with my, you know, two handed plus one broadsword or whatever, it's just dinking off this thing because that's not what this thing takes damage from. And I'm only doing ones and twos to it. But I don't know. I can maybe ask the DM or they'll give me a hint like, you know, you struck this thing five or six times and it doesn't seem to even be like the most bit scratched. It's like, all right, well, that tells me that even though I think I'm hitting it, I'm not doing anything time to change things up. You know, that that level of having to be adaptive and adaptability, you don't get that with the best in slot, you know, flavor of the month build sort of game. Back to you guys. I'm trying to remember how large our DPS meter thread is at the moment. It's I think we did go over a hundred, a hundred pages. Um, oh man, <laughs> I can see right here. Let me see how many pages. It's at 191 pages right now. Our DPS meter what, discussion. Get a master's sort of presentation, just going through that entire thread, writing an entire yeah. policy review on all of the different thoughts and everything everybody has. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's uh, huge. I'm, because I'm a DD and d player uh, like you, uh, Neuro, and Phantom plays some too. Um, but we just don't play every week like you do. Um, Try to. My expectation, too, is that you don't really have a meta. Um, most, uh, what is it, most efficient tactics available. Um, and it's especially not supposed to be a focus on the individual. It is supposed to be how um, each individual synergizes with your group. So you should not be using a DPS meter to say, I've decided that you're not hitting the uh, max value for your primary archetype. So you need to switch to this secondary archetype and then you need to pick these active skills and then you need to wear this gear. And that's the way we're going to make it through this raid. One, raids are not supposed to be static. Raids and dungeons, the encounters are not supposed to be static. So your strategy should be changing each time you go back in to um, experience a raid or a dungeon. So finding the most efficient tactics available should be taking trial and error, like Steven said, and part of his answer um, on Yokai Theater. Um, it should be trial and error. Uh, hopefully you will be trying to synergize your abilities with the other people in your group and that you'll play often enough with your um favorite group that uh you know how they like to play and it's not so much oh you need to make this uh you know you're 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 a cleric and everybody knows that um ice attacks are the most efficient tactics available so all clerics should be using a ice build and uh, if you're not going to use the ice build, we're going to kick you. I mean, you should be able to do what you can do with the fire 
um, cleric and uh, or whatever your the necromancer, whatever your chosen way of playing is, um, hopefully uh, you know well how to synergize um, your build with the other build people with the builds of the other people in your group. And that's the goal we should be going for. Not so much. Um, this is the cookie cutter flavor of the month build and our dps meter has determined that this is the best way to play so you have to conform to that that's not really the way rpgs is supposed to work but lots of people don't know that because they don't care if it's an rpg they just want to get in there and do some combat and be as efficient as possible sometimes even just you know um, doing speed runs, so being so efficient that you can speed run something, you know, five times in an hour. I don't know. My thing with DPS, like, if you succeed, isn't that isn't that what you should be gauging you, you and your group on? Right? It's like, well, no, we want to succeed in a perfect way. Well, well, okay, I guess that's fine. I probably won't be running with you, but. Uh, like if I if I died, then okay, I did something shitty. I got to work on something. But if he succeeded, or not, maybe maybe you didn't. Maybe you know you look back at the tail of the tape, and it's like, oh my god, CC completely dropped the ball, and that kamikaze thing was coming straight towards the party. You managed to divert it and die and take that one on the chin. Like ace move, you saved the raid right there. Like. There's no way to measure that on a DPS meter. There's no way to measure that on a DPS meter. There's so many intangibles that you just don't get with like raw DPS, raw outputs. Doesn't doesn't tell the whole story. And the thing if you, here, if you look, it's like you look at a sport. You look at like basketball, for example. Just because someone's the highest scoring player in a game doesn't mean they were the best player. Uh, they might have just been on a heater and you kept feeding them the ball in a good place. Maybe they just kept getting fouled because they're the big guy and you don't expect him to make the free throws, but he was just having a night. You know, it's... Well, in Ashes, they shouldn't... Points as a DPS meter. <laughs> it, and this kind of goes back to the question about um, uh, the raid, the PvE raiders, the hardcore raiders, and their role here. And, like, I don't think we should really expect huge complex raids within ashes of creation i mean there should be some complexity and there probably will but something on the par of world of warcraft where maybe it makes more sense to do some dps stuff i don't i don't know that we will see that because there's this in, this intention that pvp be such a big part of this that that that's a part of that encounter the expectation is the pvx and the difficulty of that encounter is not necessarily the one-on-one -on -one you and the monster. It's the people coming in to try to stop you so they can also take that loot. Like that, and that's, I don't think that's something you measure. I mean, I guess you could still theoretically measure it in a DPS way, but like there's just so much more to it than just straight like, how's my damage? Um, so I don't know. But it's it's combat tracker, not DPS meter. That's what the people in DS meter DPS meter thread will tell you. It's really a robust combat tracker that they're and asking. What for, number so are they not... looking at? Hmm? And what number is it they're looking for? What is the What do you the, mean by number? What is the stat that they're wanting to look for the most? What are they wanting to Could track? Be. It's not necessarily most. It's just having a robust combat tracker so you can track a lot of things. It's not just DPS necessarily, is what they will tell you. Um, but, um, um, I mean, and I would say that it's not really, it's an RPG, so it should not be, uh, killing a boss should be more about, uh, removing the deleterious effects of having the boss around from the region rather than trying to get loot. Um, if you have the winter dragon, you need to get rid of the perpetual winter that is dampening uh the uh, your powers that's uh um preventing the resources that you want from appearing that's preventing the services that you want from being uh constructed um that should be the primary motive uh, motivation for getting rid of the winter dragon not what loot it has um but again all of that being said hopefully what you're doing is trying to synergize your abilities with the other people around you. Um, and you know, that's not always going to be 
the same. Uh, even when you go after that winter dragon, it should not always have the same um, minions around. It shouldn't have the exact same minions around each time you try to defeat it. But also, sometimes you fail. Failure is part of the story. It should not be that every time you go to defeat something, you immediately win. Um, so um, it should not be so simplified that you just, you know, and again, it's not static. You know, we're used to something like World of Warcraft, where once you know how to defeat the boss, um, you just go back in and you can do it over and over and over again. And it's going to be fairly textbook. But I think also like Nero was kind of alluding to sometimes you roll a one or the equivalent and, you know, you have a huge failure, even though everything else was going along great. Uh, sometimes shit happens. That should I, be OK. I am There's, curious. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say there is something I wonder about, like what the actual difference is going to be from like. You have somebody who is just able to make the I don't know what the lowest tier chintziest um, max level armor would be, for example, with the, the lowest quality ingredients that are able to make a gear of that level. And they've got those things all across their their entirety of their equipment. How far behind is that person? given relatively the same abilities and build as that same character with really nice, well-specialized gear that they've put a lot of time and effort in building up and accumulating. Are they, are they like worlds apart in difference? Is it like, like a two to three times multiplier? What's, what's going to be the range of differential and competence and usefulness? Because it makes me wonder how how far back somebody with less maxed out, less specialized gear is going to be uh, playing with higher quality raiders. If it's more, you know, if you know your roles and you know how to play them correctly and you know how to do the things where your class's abilities, or your archetype's abilities are specifically supposed to be used at this point and that point, then um, how much does it actually matter that you're not fully spec'd up. Maybe you're taking a little bit more damage. Okay, well, I can understand that's an issue. You might have to, you know, play a little bit safer. Um, you know, maybe you have poor cooldowns and when there's an ability that everybody needs to be able to fire every five seconds, you can only fire it every seven and a half seconds. So you miss, you know, uh, every other with it or, you know, whatever the rotation is going to be. Okay. That sucks, but you know you can still participate to some extent. So uh, that's that's also what I wonder with this is what the what the overall differential is going to be. How poor, how bad off are you going to be in terms of being able to perform on the level of other players just because your gear is poorer than them, or by the time you're at max level, are you already going to have the skills and the build and the 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 specificity and the experience playing the game that you'll probably be able to just walk into a role of that type and do pretty well. And, you know, maybe there's more fine tuning that has to happen. Maybe you wipe on a raid encounter once or twice and you guys need to go back and fine tune a couple of things. Maybe you're not the weakest link and, and you know, it's just perception that you might have been the one holding things back. Who knows? Again, you know, that's it, that's it, what I'm kind of excited to see. It, it shouldn't be a gear factor. It should not be necessarily a level factor or an active skills factor. Um, and it should not be about, uh, we looked at this and we think that you didn't use these active skills when you were supposed to. It's supposed to be with Ashes of Creation, the potential, the great potential that it has is that you know how to combine your augments and your active skills to synergize with um, the other players in your group. So if you see that the uh, cleric has used an ice ability, um, then the mage knows to use an ice ability and the rogue knows that they should stack the ice ability and maybe alone that rogue's uh, active skill would not do a lot of damage but because they used an ice augment when the mage used an ice 
uh, active skill that is going to kind of help maximize or um, strengthen that attack. So it's not the individual person's um, individual active skill or individual build. It's really knowing how to synergize what you have with the rest of the people in the group. That That's what we should be looking for in Ash's um, group combat, I think. There were two other things that came out of that that I thought were interesting. Um, one, Stephen kind of talked a little bit about like what sounded like emergent gameplay. I think he had commented on a raid boss maybe not having the same skills the next time you came around or has a different skill. Right. And so the encounter is different, which sounds That's right. a lot like what we were expecting with EverQuest Next and Storybricks. That was that uh, whole utility-based AI system, we've really still not heard a word as to what kind of AI is being used, um, any of it really, when you think about that. Uh, we've seen encounters that have been fairly generic, but we don't know how they learn, how they process what, um, what they're going to do. Um, so I'll be very curious to see um, how that plays out um, and what he meant by that. If it was a very simple process that you can then learn after, you know, three or four encounters, or if it truly is more kind of a random uh, learning process for whatever mob you're fighting. Um, sounds sounds Again, also, curious. it's not supposed to be the exact same minions um, necessarily, but it's supposed to, you know, right. You know, it, and, they might not have the exact same uh, range of abilities or attacks. Um, so it's he, it's been in the wiki for a long time that it's not supposed to be exactly the same. Once you leave and come back, it's not supposed to be the exact same battle. But, um, you know, again, that's true with um, um, our augments and everything, right? It, our, the, what we used before might not be as useful the next time we go in so and there was um, it should be trial and error another and also i guess i don't know if i should say interesting but a question about the use of raid bosses in the pvp aspect so if you're fighting something that has a uh, fire breath and you get your tank to place that spell on people that are trying to pvp you for the boss so basically using the bosses um skills against whoever's fighting you um which sounds it, it sounds interesting to see how that I'm, I'm curious to see the videos that come out of that at the end that just sort of sounds like training things that have kind of existed already for a while um since really everquest but uh um that hadn't really entered my mind yet and how this will all play out with pvx so that would be i think that'll lead to some very interesting uh, encounters um as there's still so much to keep going. We're already 40 minutes in. There's um, the, one of the biggest thing I wanted to talk about that came out of this interview, and it was related actually to damage. It was a question about damage types and resistances and gear and loadouts. And sort of th very briefly, um, Stephen mentioned that warehouse inventory for crafted goods will be globally accessible. Um, so from every node, you can access your warehouse of completed items, um, which I think is a very interesting talking point. I, I, he actually joined Discord afterwards and answered several questions that um, that I asked. One was, you know, does that require being a citizen or owning housing at the node in order to have that access? And the answer was no. Um, so it sounds like anyone can access their warehouse from a node. Now, I don't I failed to ask whether there's a node level requirement, a building requirement um, that the mayor has to put out. But um, you can access your items from basically anywhere, which, you know, when we start talking about one of their big things on the economic pillar was no global auction house. There's still technically no global auction house. It's a local process but if you can just access items from anywhere um and insert them into that local economy without having to transport them it's very that seems very i don't know counterintuitive for the whole system that they were working on i don't know what y'all think about that 
it it goes back to something I've been saying this entire time and reinforces it in full. I've been saying the entire time that it really sucks for gatherers and processors to have to be out there risking it, mostly gatherers being out there risking it in such a way that they can get kicked over and lose their nice resources that they craft that they've gathered that um, can then be processed and crafted into stuff. You know, if they've got their stuff stashed at a, a, a location somewhere and that location gets kicked over, you lose it. Now, as a gatherer, you don't have, as far as I'm aware, an end crafted state that counts as a completed item. I don't know that I can take a, a stack of 100 stone and turn that into a parcel of stone item that then sits in my normal inventory because again a parcel of stone well that's a resource why would i be taking that out of the resource side of things so it's it's the fact that crafters they don't really have the same risk of loss if i'm trying to sell things somewhere else i don't carry the items, run the risk of A, losing them because that isn't a thing in this game, but B, whenever I brought this up in the past, the risk was, oh, well, while you're transporting the goods, you might get knocked over and now there's a repair fee on everything that you were carrying. How do you like that, brother? Well, what I don't like is, brother, that's, uh, I'm the one who's in brother, by the way, nobody actually said that on their side. Um, is is that okay so that takes all of the risk out of it whatsoever i go from i'm a crafter i get my resources i craft my thing i go from point a to point b i can go sell them there there's no risk of loss i the 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 risk is that i'm in a different location than i'm normally at and i don't have the opportunities there that's the same if you want to call it risk as being anywhere that you're not at in any game or any place in the real world or otherwise yeah okay sure that's fine but the transportation of goods part is completely taken out that i make my end product and then i can go somewhere else and sell that end product there's no risk for me in terms of losing the stuff incurring a repair bill that prevents me from trading it or something like that whatever so end crafters have it good you make your stuff, you stash it in the warehouse, you can sell that wherever you want. Your home gets knocked over. Oh no, oh no, the freehold got knocked over. Oh no, the node got knocked over. Oh, whatever am I gonna do? All those nice swords I was gonna sell are already finished and crafted and waiting in any warehouse I can go to anywhere. That really sucks for gatherers and processors in a big way. And I don't know what the right solution is, but it's something that's kind of irked me as a design point since the beginning. And it's it's basically just been reaffirmed by saying, yeah, completed items are just in your personal bank. How many? We don't know. Who knows? Um, yeah, that he did comment on the inventory, the item inventory of the, the character. Um. I think he said robust or a large number of slots. So I would assume you could probably think the same for warehouse. Well, that was also that, that was also because he was saying um, they do expect people to carry a bunch of gear that you're not just carrying one set of armor and you're not carrying just one weapon that you should be expecting to have different sets that you swap in and out of based on the thing. It sounded like there's going to be like a quick one bot button sort of loadout swap sort of thing. Um, if you're out of combat, obviously. Um, that's interesting. Now, also in Discord. I mean, what if they, that really makes me wish that Bill Trost was with them so we could see his face when Steven says that. Now, Stephen also said they have three um, econ people, economists, working with them on their system. Um, not a lot was said beyond that. But um, so they have people that are, I'm sure, looking to make sure this works. It just seems weird. Um, even risk aside that that I can create something way over here to the West, as as was put in chat um, by Galwood, and then I can log out, log in completely other side of the map on an alt potentially and 
pop that item into an auction house and sell it. Now, I guess we don't know if a warehouse is shareable across alts. Um, Should that, not be. I, well, I would hope not, but, you know, any more games do to some degree, uh, mini games anyways, allow for some sharing across uh, alts. So on the server side thing, it means less um, less storage per character account, per player account rather that you have to deal with if you're on seven servers um you know that's seven different inventories they have to manage if you're on one server with seven characters well that's only one inventory they have to manage seven times that's fine yeah and as, as tangent point out it doesn't really fit with the risk versus reward scenario as as you were saying neuro like there's no transportation of goods now we um, I guess could only lose them through through caravans anyways, but um, and not personal death, but it just seems weird. It just seems for all of the risk and reward, the localization of markets uh, to be able to just dump a ton of iron swords into a space and flood the market. Like that also becomes almost like economic warfare. Like if you like there are so many different ways that you can fuck with a node that are not war related. This is just like another one. Like you can come in and just uh, disrupt their market. Like, you know, oh, you're for you're selling the swords for 50 gold. I have 100 of them. I'm going to come in and, and just dump them all in here and destroy what you're doing. There's just so many different interesting ways to interact. The other thing that sort of came up, too, that I had asked about um in discord that he also answered was you know how does this play into the idea of transporting materials because um there will be deconstruction actually uh the node stream on the academy building that was built uh the ui text it contained parts kind of what it contained within the academy um part and there was a there were deconstruction stations so so we know you're going to be able to deconstruct stuff so we always because we had talked about this with portals too or if any kind of fast travel like if i can go across the ocean to another continent and just you know bring all the iron swords over deconstruct them down into their component parts and then sell the materials that kind of defeats the whole purpose now he he did say in chat that he didn't go into detail, but he said this would not circumvent that um, risk versus reward of, of materials um, that the uh, trying to re remember the exact words, basically that the deconstruction process would not be robust enough for that to occur. Um, but I guess it's still just one of those things we'll have to get in and test because uh, just seems very strange to be able to log in when when you have a game that is so set on caravans and naval caravans and that transporting goods is such a big part of all of this. The fact that you can just log in at anywhere really and and get into your your bank is weird. Um, so there was one more thing yeah, that came up. That's a test thing. Um, that I wanted to also kind of talk about, which he actually didn't say much, but was the black market. Um, we don't know much about it, and I'm very curious. I, I'm 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 curious what y'all think that might be because this was in the context of how we would. The question was about how players would generate gold, and um, like what was the primary way we would earn gold in the game, and it was through the certificate system, which he also interestingly said they have a different name for that they've not released um, because it's lore related. So that sit my head spinning like, OK, if they're not certificates, what are they called? That's lore related. Uh, Russian contracts. <laughs> oh, uh, would like to know, though. Um, but anyways, he, he was commenting on um, certificates basically being the primary method. So you could sell certificates either straight for gold or you could sell certificates for commodities that you could then transport to another node. And the further you transported those goods, the more gold you got for those commodities. Um, which is interestingly enough, you also have to use the certificates to pay your taxes on your land. Um, and he did try to rationalize. He said that part of why they're doing that is so that um, you can't have sort of real money, real world trading of gold as a way to gain um, housing because you'll actually have to play the game in order to have the certificates 
to pay your taxes, which is actually is a positive thing. But through all of this, uh, he commented on. Wait, wait, wait! But does does that mean that where are we getting certificates from? Uh, turning in quests, killing things. Um, okay. All right. I mean, there's going to be a variety I of ways. Think of certificates with um, caravans is where I've heard certificates before. So as long as there's other places besides that that we get them like quests, that's fine. Well, and, and certificates are um, not tradable unless you, they do drop, though, on death. So this might be part of where caravans, but personal. And those become um, um, stolen certificates, which can only be sold on the black market. And so I'm super curious to see how the black market works and what else is there. It sounded like the black market was something that a node or freeholds actually has to specialize to like specking into having a black market now that makes me wonder what the limitations are is that something that economic nodes are only allowed to have and that the other nodes aren't allowed to have those so you've got to go to the um uh the shady trade stop down the road if you want to um cash in those things uh and then the other side of that it makes me wonder uh, the the maintenance and operation of a black market, if that has other effects, if that automatically has like a uh, happiness uh, downgrade multiplier or something that you're always at like, you know, times 0.9 happiness because you have a black market, just because people know, you know, the people coming around using it are cd ne'er-do-wells that are beating people up and taking their stuff and that the black market is bringing them around town and yes on one hand they're a source of business and revenue but on the other hand it's like kind of some like organized crime mafia racketeering sort of stuff so um <laughs> the, the 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 black market makes from from the sound of it if there's some lore related reason why these things exist the black market makes it sound like, oh, yeah, I can get like most of this off of this thing here for you. Sure. And I'm going to take a little bit of it myself. And then, you know, a little bit gets corrupted and we just throw that out in the back. Because I will thoroughly like it. Yes. If nodes can be transitioned into black markets somehow, that would be an unexpected play style. That would be, I think, a lot of fun. Um, of course, if it's sanctioned by the node, I guess, how do you call it black market? Um, you know, there has to be some sort of seediness to it, but yeah, well, that's, I think why all of the names for these things maybe haven't been announced yet, that there's some other, um, explanation for all of this, that you're, you're stealing somebody else's personal deeds and, and actions. I stole your history. Like black Seems like a black market would be associated with the Thieves Guild, which is one of the um, social organizations. So, very well, could yeah, that makes sense. And, and I wonder, has yeah. there have they ever talked about is there a way to grow specific social organizations? So, if I'm mayor and we have a Thieves Guild in our node, can I? I wonder if I can do things in order to encourage the growth of that social structure over another. I believe so. Yes. With participation of your um, citizens, yeah. Because so, so I've this this makes me very interested in, especially in a role playing way of how I can. Again, it's all about destroying the world. So, um, earn a little money with it too. That's fine. Works for me. Mm -hmm. So, um, I wanted to. We're getting close to time. So I, I actually rather. I wanted to go over the next stream that they talked about, which was world events. Um, so that is what is coming up next. They are apparently going to show a wave event. And the way this was talked about, these are world events are pop up challenges that adapt to player strength um, and um, can last 20 to 30 minutes. Um, that sound interesting to you? How do you get there? Got to walk. And there's no fast travel. So how are you going to participate to 30 in minutes. the world? Event? Get on that horse and get that thing trotting. I'm sure there'll be more than one world event at a time. Yeah. 
I wonder yeah, how they'll be I signaled and indicated to people if it's like you see a giant flare in the sky and it's like, all right, you got two hours to get there. Did you have an idea? It'll be interesting. Plan ahead. Yeah, indeed. Well, uh, maybe somebody who knows a little bit more about like story and narrative uh, would want to <laughs> maybe say something about uh, how these things might that? present themselves, perhaps. Um, you know, any, anybody who's related to lore and narrative stuff might. There's you know, only a way to know like, how we can trigger these. <laughs> but I suppose that's that's content for the stream. They'll they'll hopefully be talking about that stuff. Yeah, if I want ah, to, you know, that's that's true. Uh, if you want to go to a fair at a place, you got to be in the place where the fair is going to be. So uh, but how does that extrapolate to like, you know, waves and battles and stuff is like, all right, at like 2 p.m. on um, Varen Tuesday, we're going to throw this stink bomb in this goblin fortress. And then as they all come scurrying out, we're going to see how many of them we can bop on the head with a big old hammer. It's a big squeaky hammer, but it knocks them cold. All right, everybody, grab your bopping hammers and let's throw the stink. Like how much advertisement, what is going to be the lead up and stuff for people to know? Like, you know, you, you, you give the example there, the L.A. County Fair. What if I don't even know what the hell in L.A. County is? Like, what if I don't even know what Los Angeles is? And it's like, OK, well, um, clearly I'm not going to be able to find that event because I don't even know the name of the place where it's at. I ain't even heard of it. <laughs> yeah, guess I'll be missed. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess I won't miss missing the fair if I don't know about it. You're right. But I saw somebody play. stream it on the different server, man. I want to play it. It was in a different place. I was hanging out there, but it happened somewhere else. It was elf themed this time, too. <laughs> mm. yeah, maybe there would be a way to open yeah, it. Yeah, I guess I have everything it. on a wiki for me to look it up. <laughs> uh, I heard the word wiki way too many times today. That was the response to like every question asked. It's like, it's like no, we look, for, we look to clarify the wiki. Yes, there was a question about this on the wiki already. We're trying to clarify that further for you. Like, anyways, yeah. The odds of Stephen answering a question that's not at all on the wiki are very small. But um um, yeah, so I'm curious, you know, of course, when I think of world events, um, a lot of games have them now. Um, Diablo, I mean, you can join things, Diablo 4, World of Warcraft. Um, I think, I'll ultimately, I think back to Warhammer Online, I think had a, had a world quest system that was very well done in both how you can join the difficulty, uh, uh, how it would escalate, and then also the reward system afterwards. Um, Defiance was good about that, too. It was very clear when and where events were happening, and mm -hmm. it would auto scale you to a, a gear level to which you could actually participate and not get melted. Mm. So I'm I'm curious to see how things will be done a little bit differently, or if they even will, um, to make it newer and fresher. Um, with the World of Warcraft stuff, I mean, that's basically was just their evolution of dailies and instead of a daily set of dailies that you flagged the NPC and you got four quests, you just started doing world events, which was just basically the same thing, but repackaged, um, mm -hmm. which was cool initially. And then the next expansion, oh, the same thing. It's just, just a new, new form of daily. Um, 20 to 30 minutes seems long, um, which I'm curious about as well. Compared to a three to six hour raid? No, nah, that's kind of short. Well, for a world event. Yeah. For a public mm, well, that's why I was initially uh, thinking world event meant like a world boss, which is a little bit different, I think. Um, well, it could. So if you're talking about the kind of events that pop up uh, every two hours in um, World of Warcraft, then yeah, you have time to get there because there's an announcement that's saying it's going to start in an hour. So you kind of know you can find out that it's going to happen and you got an hour to get there and it's going to last 20 or 30 minutes that's that's good i was thinking more in terms of like world boss like the event system where you have probably days not hours or minutes the goblins are coming out to attack and you know that's lasting 
days or weeks, not not just hours or minutes. Um, or the winter dragon, um, where yeah, yeah, these were referred to as pop up challenges. Time. So definitely sounded yeah. outside yeah. of the main mm-hmm. storytelling node system. Um, yeah, remember rifts were supposed to be a surprise. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, this has been done before. Yeah. So that's mm-hmm. why I'm I'm curious if there is going to be any sort of difference um, put on it, uh, or if this is just going to be another, basically a time sink, a way to just keep you involved um, and have I that play. Do want to mention uh, before we leave that Yokai Theater was in the chat and said. I want the world to be the main character of the story, not the player, which I think yeah. uh, we all agree with. Yes. Again, if only we knew someone that did lore for <laughs> a game that we like that we could talk about this with. Um, if only we knew someone. We we did ask Stephen if somebody like that could be on our uh show sometime and he said he would look into that so maybe oh, we no, can get not. somebody well, but, oh yes he did he said not before probably not before launch no he did not say that it, Nero, you were there uh we'd have to look up the records on that one we don't uh, have I'm the records gonna... there wasn't anything <laughs> recording at that point oh wait you're right hmm I'm pretty certain because they just really are holding that lore very close. Um, oh, he might not we, be talking we get about lots lore. Of he might not be able to, he's not going to talk about lore. We don't have to, oh, that's not lore. Oh, well, of Top course. Top challenge is not necessarily, is not necessarily lore. So yeah. That, he did, did you guys that. have an imaginary conversation with Steven? No, uh, but we have spoken with him three times now. Um, <laughs> so. Well, we've spoken with them more than three times, and I've definitely spoken with them more than three times. So, um, but yeah, you have a point. We wouldn't obviously ask, "Hey, tell us about the lore. What happened to the gods yeah. of creation? What, what yeah. do we do? What is our main objective when we join?" Like those aren't the yeah, but he's still. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> uh, no, he said we could have that person, that specific person. He said Maybe if that person wrong. wants to be on this, he said if that person wants to be on the show, he'll have to ask that person and we'll see. Um, so we just have to bop him on the head to make sure he asks that person. Because I still want to know how you craft stories that may or may not ever be shown. I'm, I'm super interested in that process. Mm. So. Mm-hmm. Well, we um, didn't even get back to the nodes um, stream. Um, so um, I was really curious about talking about the mayoral ship and the different possibilities of how one will get elected. I'm definitely going to be staying away from the ranked choice, popular cho- uh, ranked choice, popular choice. Um, that seems to be a no brainer going to. Uh, streamers and those sorts of things. But that's a different discussion. We are after our time here. So um, thanks for watching, everyone. We will be back next Sunday. um, Same time, same place. And as always, if you want to continue the conversation, just join our Discord. Uh, We are always in there. um, Play games together, too. So like I said, right now is No Man's Sky. Anybody's interested, just hit us up in there. I'll be happy to play. And Um, Destiny 2. Destiny 2. Destiny yep, 2. that gets played as well. Low BG3. Um, haven't jumped back into that because I've been messing around with No Man's Sky. Um, which, interestingly enough, Starfield is what put me into No Man's Sky and has now kept me in No Man's Sky. Um, but, all right, everybody. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, thanks again um, for the... Uh, Yokai Theater for the interview today that went, uh, congratulations, went well, and for the content we got to talk about out of it. So uh, everyone have a great week, and we will see you here next Sunday. See you later, everybody.